brought up issues already that we will probably discuss some more, which is a grid idea, and then uh, the revenue generation. Uh, I think we will discuss about this uh, Chinese loan to Laos and how much Laos depends on uh, hydropower revenue for its, uh, its base, uh, its viability. Uh, and as we mentioned, you know, the, the sub-regional architecture, if you will, of power generation and consumption it's, it's very rudimentary. There's no, there's very little cooperation and coordination. So there's a lot of space, a lot of room to, to go into, uh, but it takes a lot of collective concerted effort. Uh, I want to introduce my colleagues. Uh, first, Dr. Carl Middleton. Uh, he has been with us for some time, uh, understated, but he is the most accomplished, one of our most accomplished writers, authors in the faculty. He's been teaching, he's been uh, um, focusing on research in the, in the mainland Southeast Asia and Myanmar. Myanmar also has a grid problem. In Myanmar, Laos is very interesting, you know, very well endowed, but not, they don't have enough electricity um, for their own people. So Dr. Carl Milton has been researching in Laos and Mekong, um, up and down, and then also now in, in Myanmar. So we'll hear from him first, and then to, uh, after that, my, my longtime colleague, uh, Dr. Nurmon, who has been the head of the Master of Arts in the International Devel Development Studies Program, uh, and also she teaches in the government department. So, Dr. Ka. Thank you, Ajahn Sitnam, for the generous introduction. And um, thank you very much for a very stimulating report. Um, I've very much enjoyed reading it. Uh, so thank you for inviting me to be the discussant. Um, I'll cover three topics, but quite briefly, because I think there's also, I'd expect a lot of discussion wanting to come from the room. Um, so three things that sort of really stood out for me in, in the case of this report. Your focus on risks and how they're apportioned. Um, the discussion on alternatives, which I think is also very important. And then the need to affirm mechanisms of regional cooperation in different ways, both on the river, but also in terms of finance and its accountability, including bringing China into the discussion. Um, and then I think for me, the, the need to talk about how to widen and deepen access to justice in all of these different uh, issues. So first on the issue of focusing on risks and how they're apportioned. So I think, as you're saying, like one of the key arguments of the report is that you argue that um, both civil society activism and the concern of neighboring states has raised the bar somewhat in terms of hydropower development in Laos and the Mekong mainstream. And I, I can see that the sorts of mechanisms that you're talking towards are that this form of resistance is argued to increase the internalization of costs, um, highlights gaps in existing studies, and in some cases, especially maybe civil society activism, highlights different normative visions for development in the region beyond the current way that um, economic growth is privileged. And the consequence of these arguments is that you argue that not all dominoes may fall in the case of the hydropower dams. Um, I think I mean, the activism around these projects is definitely significant, but I think it's only one of a number of factors that can help explain what's, um, what's unfolded so far and power inequalities and, and public space that is varied across the region and sometimes uh, closing and, and some spaces opening um, needs to be taken into account. Um, I think, and then you also highlight, I think you emphasize in particular finance and political risks and talk in particular about the role of private banks, commercial banks and state-owned enterprises. Um, and then just in this presentation now, you've also put onto the table some of the new issues, the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank. I think maybe one other um, consideration is maybe new, other new forms of financing. So the Zaibri project is maybe looking at how to list on the stock exchange of Thailand. Um, Mega First Corporation Berhan, the Malaysian company for Don Tohong, is also seeking um, finance through the stock markets. And normally we'd assume that stock market investors are also pretty clued up on how to gauge risk. So I think the, the question is about how risk is being understood in these projects. And for my interest, 
I think is a very provocative argument that you're putting across that there may be a change in the actual model by, what, by which these projects are developed. So historically, hydropower dams and large infrastructure in general have been state projects because in the past, it was understood that large dams were developed by the state for the public good, and states often had the most money available to build these sorts of schemes. And then in the 1980s, as neoliberalism swept across the world, a new model emerged, the public-private partnership model, and the privatization process, and private sector stepped in to develop types of projects like large dams <coughs> that in the past would have been built by the state. And new models emerged, this public-private partnership essentially is a partnership between private sector investors and the um, state. And then in your report, you talk about the build, operate, own, transfer model, which is essentially an entirely, a project entirely funded by the private sector and operated, and then at the end of a concession period, transferred back to the state once again for its final operation and decommissioning. So I guess I was trying, when you talk about the, de the end of the BOOT model, I mean, I could imagine it, but I couldn't imagine a return back to state-led development because for the reasons that you named, that states don't have the funding and it totally does not fit with the current policy direction of the region's governments. But I could imagine a more of an emphasis on public-private partnerships. And this is, I think, the first area that I wanted to briefly explore because within public-private partnerships, the name of the game is risk redistribution. Who carries which risks? And I think private sector is very savvy at redistributing risks from, from, the, from, their, own, from their own interest to the state. So if we look at a public-private partnership model and we think about ideas of risk redistribution, it doesn't necessarily mean that these projects will not go ahead. It just means that the risk is being borne by different actors. So we could say, well, if, if we're talking in particular about the projects in Laos or Cambodia, a public-private partnership model would basically say, how does the private sector redistribute risk back onto the state again? And in terms of the state, what do we mean? Essentially, the state is the representative, representative of the people, so it's a redistribution of risk back onto people again. Um, there are ways that the risk can be reduced. One is the fact that in this region, when a project is being built, a hydropower project, there's long-term power purchase agreements which basically guarantees a steady revenue flow for that project. So in other words, already the consortium, whoever it is, has a continued, a continued guaranteed flow of money, so they know their risks. I think it's interesting that you focus on banks. Normally banks are paid back first. So the other funders afterwards, maybe state lending, gets, gets paid back after the private banks get paid back. Um, so in that case, I think we could say that there may be a reapportioning of risks within these projects, and it would go to the Lao state or the Cambodian state, to the Lao people, the Cambodian people, and this is not even in, this is not including the risks of repairing communities. Um, but then it also is borne by electricity consumers because these long-term power purchase agreements essentially displace the cost of electricity production in the long term onto people that buy the electricity in the end. But I think you also made a very valid point because. In, in the context of understanding how states could accept these risks, we also need to look at the nature of states, and I think that Ajahn Naraman is gonna pick up this idea. Like the turn towards fairly authoritarian states within the region, maybe an understatement, especially where these projects are being built, means that risks are sometimes readily accepted by state and with little resistance put onto the people that bear them. You bring up Mitzvah Dam, and I think that's a very interesting case because the Mitzvah Dam in Myanmar was agreed to by the previous junta military government and then was cancelled by the government, the current government under President Tin Sen, who is turning more towards a form of democracy in the country. So I think that what I take home from that is a very significant idea that changing domestic politics can change the viability of projects to the point where international norms of contractual commitments are willing to be broken if it serves a domestic purpose. Um, one thing that I, and I think also the other important point, when we normally think of reputational risk, we normally think of private companies. But I think pr private companies that sell products to people, so they're very visible. But I think the idea of the reputational risk of China is also very significant that you bring up in the report. So I, I would say that I put in a list of, of actors that are involved in these projects that do have reputational risk, 
include China and state-owned enterprises, the commercial banks, and the, maybe the stock exchange of Thailand or Malaysia. But the construction and energy companies do not carry those sorts of reputational risks in the same way. Um, I thought, so there were some risks I think were either downplayed or, or missing. Um, one is the risk of species extinction. Nobody speaks for nature in this case, but really this is a very anthropocentric model that we're seeing of development in the region. Um, maybe it's a little bit too optimistic in terms of the livelihood recovery programs um, that are currently being proposed by the project developers or being implemented. The region has a very poor track record of livelihoods recovery in the context of these large projects. And I think we can't ignore that track record. Even if new things are being said to be done, we have to look at the past as well. And that's what's different from the past to the present. Um, so in, in other words, just to summarize this point, I think what we need to recognize is that there will be a politics of risk redistribution in these projects if the state is to become more present in their development. Um, and that involves power. So I think, simply put, who bears more risk often have less power. Um, those that are most marginalized will be the communities, the repairing communities themselves. Um, banks probably have the most power because they are the lenders that make these projects viable, and they tend to be guaranteed within the contractual arrangements and the power purchase agreements. States will tend to prioritize economic growth, but maybe justify it through poverty reduction. So I think how the state decides to redistribute the risks onto environment and society is also a key question towards these projects. Um, I think another dimension of power and risk redistribution is, as Ajahn Titinan mentioned at the beginning, the role of China as the upstream country. So I think upstream countries actually have a, a power in this relationship over downstream countries because they can, as you say in your report, almost go ahead unilaterally. Um, but for the role of China's projects, it brings uncertainties to downstream developers because, quite simply put, nobody knows how China's projects will be operated and how that will affect the economic viability of the downstream projects. Um, do I have time for a couple more? Okay. Just to put onto the table, I think an important aspect of the report is that you do discuss alternatives. The Lao grid is a very interesting idea that I'm not as familiar with. Um, I guess my question would be, if, could it not be both at the same time developing a Lao grid with the Mekong mainstream dams? What sorts of guarantees could there be that this would be an alternative rather than a complement to the Mekong mainstream land projects? I think Thailand is a key factor in this in terms of alternatives. And um, you emphasize in your report the high potential for energy efficiency. And uh, I think that's a very valid point. Um, but there are also some <coughs> politics of the policy that act as barriers to the energy efficiency being pursued. I think you could also talk about the renewable energy potential in Thailand and how that could be built or more into the energy mix. And maybe in China now has the largest renewable energy industry in the world. How could China actually support Thailand's transition to a renewable energy economy? Um, I think that other debates also need to be had within Thailand's energy sector. So coal versus hydropower, for example, how, not, how to avoid playing one off against the other. Um, I think the bottom line in case of Thailand's energy sector is that there's this sort of pathway dependency of how past investment has shaped what options are currently perceived to exist amongst, in particular, those that make decisions on energy planning in the country. I think that the most important development alternative is to recognize the value of the river itself. So I think it's almost like a forced polemic between economic growth versus poverty reduction. Or like, I, I think we should see the river as um, a safety net. It's central to human security. It's actually complementary to economic growth rather than being one or the other. Um, my, if I can have a few more minutes, my, my last area of, of thinking was on affirming the commitment to regional cooperation um, and enforcing access to justice. I, I think I appreciate your report in the sense that it refocuses debate again onto the role of the Mekong River Commission. Um, there's a big question mark over the future for many reasons. One is its leadership as it transitions to a new CEO from the region. There's big questions over the future in terms of funding with many Western donors actually considering stepping back from funding the Mekong River Commission. So it will be a measure of the commitment of the region's governments to transboundary cooperation as to whether new sources of funding will be found for the Mekong River Commission. I think the other big question as to whether the MRC is viable or not is how can it engage China in the future? Um, I appreciate very much you bringing in the idea of nexus 
at this sort of food, water, energy nexus. I think it's, so, I mean, it basically says that there's a set of trade-offs. Even the World Economic Forum is very interested in this idea of nexus. The World Economic Forum rates water security as one of the top three or five risks to economic growth globally. So they, they see water as a foundation of economic development. Um, but I think that the way that many nexus debates have been interpreted in this region so far is very technical and technocratic. And what I'd actually like to see is a more normative discussion on the nexus, like a normative nexus. Um, I think the value of having a nexus discussion is to say, well, there are big gaps between water and energy planning. So another big challenge for the Mekong River Commission is how do you bring energy planners into the room to discuss about water governance, including on transboundary rivers. That this is an issue because energy planners think about energy security and other forms of environmental costs get readily externalized. So water, people that think more about water security, food security, need to be in those discussions so that energy planners actually internalize the costs of environmental and social um, consequences of these projects. Um, there's been some recent innovations, um, like different extraterritorial obligations emerging. So I think the trends that you pinpoint, the role of Thailand's um, Supreme Administrative Court accepting a case towards a project in Laos is very significant because it recognizes that justice has to trans trans go across borders. It doesn't just remain in the country where the project is located. So I think that the final challenge I would throw to the report is how can we, I think there needs to be more discussion on access to justice across borders. Um, I've been using an idea called arenas of justice and I think that what I, what I try and say through that idea is the MRC is, is too narrow an arena. We can't just talk about water in the, at the MRC alone. We need to be talking about it in national courts. We need to be talking about it in national human rights commissions. We need to be talking about it in the ASEAN um, Intergovernmental Commission on Human Rights. And that's being done. And so if we say, what, what's the sum total of how project development can be kept to account so that only good projects go ahead, then we need to sort of widen our understanding of how these decisions are undertaken. So I think with that, I'll, I'll stop. But thank you once again for a very stimulating report. Thank you, thank you, um, Dr. Carl Middleton. Uh, comprehensive, and I think uh, you've introduced a lot of issues that I think the report perhaps uh, uh, the team back home could perhaps consider. Um, for us, you know, uh, I think the, the risk reapportionment uh, is critical. Uh, talking about reputation, Laos is known as the battery of Asia, believe it or not. Um, and Thailand is the main uh, consumer of the, uh, of the energy coming out of Laos. And the map. Thailand is, yeah. The map shows very clearly who, who is upstream. I mean, you know, you have these dams and um, there's not much that the lower, the downstream countries can do about when China um, decides to build dams up north. Uh, Atan Rumun. Uh, thank you. I have to admit that I'm really enjoying the report because I and Ajahn Khao visit Sayaburi Dam two years ago before you and we also visit Don Sahong supporting them one year ago, and now when we see the report, we see what exactly happened. Uh, I have, maybe I would say, uh, my comment will be under two answer, two questions. One is that, how do I read this report? And second, how do we make this report be heard? I mean, because otherwise we will just put the report to the society, but the authority or those who are involved may not be listened. On the first point, how do I read the report? I would term it like a new narrative, but maybe all fixing. The way they, yes, we propose the new narrative, but maybe from the report, we propose all fixing, or maybe even from the uh, government or those who involved in the project, may, they may use the old uh, fix, I mean, that's kind of thing. Why I use the word new narrative uh, in this sense? Uh, Dr. Carr already talked about political risks, but I, for me, I will look at from the stakeholder that who are the stakeholder in these two damn project. And I appreciate that uh, from the report, you already talking about the Thai government, the business, meaning the developer, and also the civil society. 
And the report is made it clear that one thing that is, can be the new narrative is that the role of civil society, especially in Thailand, to, be, to force the uh, Sayaburi Dam to be open to the public, especially bringing the case to the administrative court, and that make the Chokan Chang Company. I mean, for the Sayaburi Dam, I might say that this is a Thai thing. Right. It is fun by the Thai bank, it's uh, built by the Thai developer, and the buyer is the ECAT. And those who will use this, this electricity is Thai, so basically this is a Thai Thai thing. Put a, put a picture behind you now. Yeah. Right yeah, so in that case, it's valid in a sense that the Thai civil society bring the case to the Thai National Human Rights Commission because it's done by the Thai company. So the Thai company as an issue of the human right. So they put some certain role with the National Human Rights Commission and the Thai Administrative Court to saying that we is our obligation to look at how I mean the Thai company create a problem to I mean our neighboring. But in the Don Sahong case, one thing that I feel is missing is the Malaysian. The Malaysian disappear from the scene, even the mega first is from the Malaysian company, and we didn't see any word from the Malaysian government or Malaysian civil society. And I think it will be on the right time right now when Malaysian has a debate about the issue of corruption, the debate between the color, right, red and yellow color in Malaysia right like now. Maybe one thing that can be the lesson from the Don uh, from the Sayaburi case that we didn't see the role of the stakeholder in the case of the developer in case of the Malaysian, the, the maker first. And the second thing in terms of the stakeholder, we talking to the Lao as they are homogeneous. Like we just, we know that Lao have a problem with the authoritarian at a certain level with the Lao government, but maybe one thing that we may have to bear in mind is that the the even even though the Lao the 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 the, the is a state enterprise in terms of generating the electricity and the role of civil society is very limited. But when you see the local people, I mean we might be able to compare. In my opinion, the Don Sahong case is more dynamic than the Lao people in the Sayaburi Dam. Why? Because in the Don Sahong case, they are the border between Laos and Cambodia. But in the Sayabuli, it's basically from the Lao perspective, it's inland, it's inside their territory. So who the hell are we comment on the mainland? So they, in that case, on the Sayabuli, it can be processed quite fast because Lao argue under the nation state centric approach that inside their own country is the territory of the map home. But in, in Don home, they cannot do that. Maybe one thing is that we might have to look at the dynamic of the stakeholder in case of the, I mean, the Don home case. And in that case, that we can bring in with the uh, MRC, the map home river commission, because comparing between Sayaburi and Don home is that the MRC speak more louder in the Don Sahong case comparing with the Sayaburi case. And I remember that in the Sayaburi case, we could not even read the EIA report. It's considered classified information, which is comparing with the Don Sahong exchange. Maybe the report will create more, even newer narrative in a sense that through the time period, Right now, it have to make it more public, and in that case, we can see more comment with the in the case of the I mean the uh, environmental impact assessment in this case. The second point that's related to the stakeholder analysis is that when we looking about the uh, GMS country, meaning the Cambodian and the Vietnam, the Thai, the Lao, and also the China. We didn't see anything. I mean, we see China factor as the, what you call, from the state point of view, as the maybe a private enterprise that give loan. 
one thing that we might have to see the, the dynamic in China, which is also we listened yesterday, is that China also would like to be seen that it will follow global governance. So we should make use of these kind of things. China doesn't want to be that they are that the grasshopper that doing development and run away. No, this is not the perspective of China anymore, including the Chinese uh, civil society in that sense. And, and also, we also have to see that right now, those who do the investment from China, they are the private company. They are not the state enterprise anymore. So they would like to be seen at the international standard. So maybe in that case, the China factor will not only seen from the, I mean, they are from the upstream building the dam, but also they would like to be involved in this kind of project. And I believe that if we use this kind of the stakeholder analysis in this way, the new narrative will be even newer. Uh, the other thing is that why still all fixing? The fixing at the moment, both from the report and from the response of the uh, project developer, is that they still use the environmental engineering engineering fix all, right? We have the problem with fish leather, so let's do fish, fish bypass. So it's just like, okay, the fish cannot go to the leather, so let's go to another road with the bypass. But I'm not sure whether the fish understand this way, right? Can we do the bypass or even propose the sauna to Irrawaddy dolphin? So with the sauna, this is not, this is Irrawaddy dolphin, is not the real dolphin. I'm not sure whether when we talk about sauna or this kind of technology and engineering that is going to be going to work in this case and i feel that both sayaburi and don Sohong use the same method engineering fix in the sense that uh, for sayaburi uh, dam they change the level of the of the diet to be lower in order to answer the problem with the with with the uh, uh, the, the impact and on the dancer home because it's involved with the endangered species they're saying that they use the I mean fish passes way with a different way but I think the main question that the environmentalist people asking is that this is this is may not be answered by this kind of technology this we are not in the conservation pond that we use this way and it's not in the laboratory and I'm quite a, happy to read the report saying that one problem for both them is that it's no baseline data of the fish. And I think this is not only Sayabri and Don Sahong. Even the park moon, this is nearly 30 years, we still don't see the baseline data. It's closed and open, closed and open. I mean, all year like of the traffic light, but we still don't have the the baseline data of the impact to fish migration and fish species. And I think this is one thing that we, in the report, maybe like adding in the recommendation, uh, maybe will be a certain answer. Uh, the other point when I read the report is that I quite interested when, we, when the report talking about uh, the regional grid. But one thing that this is a certain issue that we have to bear in mind is that to talking about the grid, it means that we reconcentration of the decision making of power of the electric city. And I'm not sure to do the concept to make it centralization with this the concentrate back to the center. I mean, either who will make decision which center government allow the Thai the Cambodia, the Myanmar. I'm not quite sure whether it will be possible in ASEAN, this kind of character, because we are still under nation state centric approach. I'm not sure whether each nation state will allow the so-called regional grid to work. And at the moment, one thing that we see a certain problem in the Thai case is that Thailand has the na national grid and Thailand argue that, okay, we will take care only under the Thai territory. We will not involve with the Laos, with the Cambodia, with the Myanmar, but if we propose the regional grid in terms of electricity, how is going to be happen, who make decision? 
maybe one thing will be easier I would like to follow Ajahn Khao is that maybe decentralization of power may be more possible so in that case people who are direct affected by the damn project may have more voice or more say something like that that may be a certain thing maybe subgrid in this way and that may be the answer uh, to give more time with the audience I will go directly to the second point like how to make this report hurt I mean this is a certain thing this is a problem right the report is written with a certain assumption that we will have what you call open public space to discuss in terms of changing policy <laughs> but if we look at Thailand right now or Lao, or I'm not sure the election in Myanmar how it's going to be the result or Malaysian right now we rather I mean Ajahn Titinan might use the word illiberal but I will use the word neo-authoritarian developmental state the state is now more authoritarian kind of perspective look at the Thai government right now and their five-year plan policy look at the Lao right now or Malaysian right now so in that case how to make this report to be heard with the authoritarian state who saying that I will be the champion to bring in the development to my people or to my country I think one thing that we may have to say in that is that even though you talk uh, the, the, the government is more authoritarian one thing that it has to answer as accountable to the people is that this kind of project do they have any benefit back to the people I didn't heard anything from the Lao government apart from the income generation but it's no any other process that this so-called income generation to the country will be redistributed back to the people in the area that they are affected we just see only a more number of labor to be work in the project or to get a certain thing and I think the report already mentioned about migration and also more widened gap of inequality I think this is maybe the valid point to argue that even though you are authoritarian state you cannot reproducing people insecurity and I think maybe the issue of human security will be can be addressed in that in a sense not only food security from fish but I mean uh, food linked with the income security and also with the community security and in that case is also a valid point when we talking about even as you are authoritarian state the problem of reproducing human insecurity is a big problem that may be happen from the report. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tan uh, Roman. And I think uh, this is a good point, the, the correlation between political regimes and regional corporations. We don't have any illiberal one around here. Illiberal is maybe Singapore. Uh, all the riparian states of the Mekong are all authoritarian. In Thailand, it's military authoritarian. Uh, the others are, even Cambodia is authoritarian. Now, um, the floor is open. I think you want to say something, but please save it for now. Uh, I have, I'm conscious of time. We have about 20 minutes or so for engagements from the, the audience. The floor is open. Uh, it strikes me that a reasonable person might possibly conclude from uh, these aspects of the report and this discussion this morning, that the new narrative could be that most of these projects should in fact not go ahead. You set out clearly the fact that they, the, the commerciality tends to be less favorable than planning assumptions suppose, and the uh, subsequent costs, both financial but also environmental and human, tend to be much greater. This is a message that's amplified by others as well. If you look, for example, at what organizations like International Rivers say about Nam Turn 2, which I think is mentioned in your report, although I, I, I didn't see it on the, on the map there, uh, their argument is that this was a damn 
whose uh, planning was considered at the time best practice. A panel of experts set up by the World Bank and so on oversee it. Uh, a lot of disillusionment subsequently. Uh, so uh, maybe there's a, a more fundamental difficulty here about uh, building dams, uh, large projects like this, in particular in environments with little accountability to civil society. That was, that was part of the problem. This leads me to a second uh, question about opportunity cost, because of course the ultimate purpose is to provide the energy needs of the region in a sustainable way. And hydro is only one part of a potential solution to that. Carl touched on this point. Uh, solar is uh, an alternative. Uh, managing demand through energy efficiency uh, as well. But also, go back to a, a, the lightest, the least uh, polluting of the hydrocarbons, gas. And here I want to return to Dr. Titanan's very helpful contextualization early on. As Dr. Titanan said, uh, we don't have the South China Sea problems here. We do have these uh, mainland issues and problems over the community uh, development and human security and so on. But the quiet, unspoken success of this region has been the capacity in the Gulf of Thailand of countries uh, who have not always uh, defined or agreed the maritime boundaries, nonetheless to fruitfully cooperate on joint development of offshore gas. Uh, two of the five world's joint development areas take place in the Gulf of Thailand. If Thailand and Cambodia uh, finally agree to what uh, is an economically very logical uh, joint development there, that will be free. So just to, to offer the alternative, if we conclude that hydro is in this part of the world in these conditions just too difficult, just too un unaccountable and so on, there are potential alternatives out there. Thank you. My name is Amy and I'm from International Rivers. Um, the premise of this report is on this new narrative that opposition to the projects have helped, in fact, improve the projects. Um, but what we've seen is a lot of the concerns and requests from neighboring countries, along with civil society, has not been met. No transboundary environmental impact assessments were ever carried out for Zayaberry or Don Sahon. There's no baseline data. Um, the Mekong River Commission's preliminary design guidance measures, which are required for all Mekong mainstream dams, have not been followed. And uh, the final design for even Zayaberry has never been released. So what we've seen is, in fact, just greenwashing of these projects. The mitigation measures are unlikely to actually be successful. And the burden of proof has been placed on people in the region rather than the developers. So right now there's the lawsuit in Thailand against the power purchase agreement and here people have to explain why they're expected to have impacts from Zayaberry Dam. But the developer is not having to show why they believe that they will not harm the Mekong River. Now uh, Courtney had mentioned that the MRC has become less irrelevant or less relevant um, and it's clear developers are also less accountable. So it would be good to hear from the Stimson Center your recommendations. What kind of policy changes would you say are needed to allow for regional cooperation so that downstream and upstream concerns are heard and that the needs are balanced? Thank you. My name is Li Hong from Chinese Embassy. Uh, I have uh, just a few comments. First of all, uh, when talking about the, uh, managing the Mekong, Mekong uh, River issue. I think we first we should understand the challenges we are facing in the region. One of the very important we are facing is energy issue, energy security in our region. We are talking about energy. We cannot ignore hydrogen uh, power, hydropower. So this is one of the options. Making use, making full use of the water resources for the, uh, of the Mekong River is one of the basic approach for the development of the region. We cannot, talking about the environment tech protection or some other issues without talking about development. In that case, so hydrogen development is still one of the very important options. We, we cannot avoid, we cannot escape from it. But the important thing is how to keep balance between energy 
development and the environment impact. So I think nowadays the regional countries have spent a lot of efforts and invest a lot of resources to do this uh, environmental um, evaluation. I think the investment in this research in this field have been uh, quite significant. Of course, we, we need more. This is the first point. The second point, uh, because we're talking about some of the Chinese factors, I think um, for the hydropower um, construction, first of all, it's not only Chinese companies are working in this field. As our colleague just mentioned, Malaysia company is uh, uh, the, the primary um, contract of the Deng Xiaohong project. So there are many other countries are involved in this area. Second, what is there are, and I agree, there are a lot of risks in these projects. I, I see a lot of uh, relatives in this report. Um, I would like to say the major progress at the moment is market driven. Market driven, that means all the companies, all the stakeholders have to share the risks. It's not only one or two countries or one or two stakeholders to, sh sh to share the um, risk. So this, this is what I want to say. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I think we'll come back to the panel. We'll start with uh, Dr. Cronin and then uh, I'll go down the line. Uh, I'll be very brief because uh, I think it's more important to get uh, views on the table and to hear your comments. Uh, but just a, a couple uh, points of, about what we're trying to do. First of all, we by no means minimize the environmental impact, the human impact, human security, food security, etc. cetera. Uh, but in undertaking this project, we started writing about those issues and uh, the issues that Amy uh, raised in particular. Uh, but at the end of the day, we, we came around to uh, uh, the concept of uh, the idea of like okay so how where are the potential vulnerabilities to these projects and uh, and it he keeps coming around to the uh, political financial risk and uh, uh, the uncertainties and so this is the example uh, Laos uh, uh, alternative models to the say the the boot model which is the current uh, thing for Sabori in particular uh, it is uh, uh, that um, Laos cannot carry risk itself. I mean, it, Laos doesn't have any money. <laughs> you know, it doesn't have the financial resources to be a legitimate uh, risk carrier. And it's fine. I mean, not fine. It's uh, unfortunately, yes, risk is being transferred uh, already and, uh, you know, greatly transferred to the burden uh, on the people. And the, the, the obligation the government has is not going to be able to carry out, or not won't have the will to carry out. So, uh, so our point is we're we're just looking at you know where are the vulnerabilities to the current uh, way of doing things, and uh, uh, that's uh, that's it. Just a minor point: uh, we didn't include uh, uh, lower Saison two uh, mainly because the MRC is only about, uh, and its protocol is only about mainstream dams. We, we quite agree that the Lower Saison 2 is a disaster in the making, uh, if not already. Uh, but so anyway, that's where we are, is we're trying to get at where might be the pressure points. Uh, and that doesn't mean we minimize the other really bad aspects of these projects. And so ultimately, we'd like to see no dams, but what, how do we find, a, is there a path through here to, to a better optimization of it? And then finally, just on energy, uh, it's still the fact that uh, Thailand overestimates its energy demands. Thailand has a very inadequate conservation program, and, uh, and at least the strict environmental assessment that was done for the MRC by a very uh, uh, distinguished expert group uh, estimated that by 2030, if all those dams were built, only they would contribute only six to eight percent of total regional electricity demand. So it's skewed. I mean, the, whole, the numbers are skewed in the sense that yes, Laos wants revenue, and Laos is the upper upstream country after China, uh, and so they're the driver of this. And commercial developers want profits, and they're the develop, uh, drivers. 
but we're, first of all, we're getting at trying to look at the profit aspect and whether that's really viable. Uh, and uh, uh, so um, uh, I, I lost my point. <laughs> I lost my own point where I was going, and I think it's probably enough. Uh, to go back to the first comment about hydropower perhaps not being the best path forward for energy and that other options are available, we, we generally agree with that. Um, and I was just going to point that part of the grid concept is that hydropower is a good base load, and obviously there are some projects, you know, Shearbury is already at this point probably 50% built, I think it's about 40% built when we were there in December. Um, there are other hydropower projects in Northern Law that are already that are already in existence. Some of these can be upgraded, but part of the grid concept is that this would provide a base load, which would also allow Lao to benefit from renewable energy sources. Um, there's been a lot of interest in the last year in some exploratory solar projects, um, not just you know the village level, but some of the larger solar factories. If there was a grid that was using hydropower as sort of a base load carrier, it would also allow them to integrate more renewable energy sources and avoid an over-reliance on hydro and also an over-reliance on fossil fuels that are important. Um, to address, I think, all three questions, we, we see this alternative as of the Lao National Power Grid as somewhat of a one country solution to the entire issue. Um, the power or the, the supposed power of the Mekong River Commission is waning. Uh, that's a truth. We don't know if it's going to be there next year, um, according to a lot of what is being revealed over the last couple of months with financial difficulties and leadership transitions. Um, not saying that regional coordination mechanisms are unnecessary, but the this concept of a grid with a potential spoke stretching into Cambodia for the purchase of power uh, by Cambodia from Laos can do so much to alleviate these pressures uh, and to help to optimize the nexus trade-offs uh, on a basin-wide scale. The, the Nature Conservancy has come out with a new report called The Power of Rivers. And, and, and I encourage all of you to, to read this report and to see how their alternatives are, are um, suggested, suggested. And it's based on increasing and maximizing connectivity uh, among river basins, so not blocking off uh, and not segmenting rivers, as well as uh, maximizing um, or minimizing the regulatory effects of dams. Uh, essentially, uh, not having, uh, allowing larger portions of the river to flow free, um, and allowing their hydrological cycle to, to run its natural effect, um, therefore not impacting agriculture, not impacting fisheries, so on and so forth. And uh, within that, there's this interesting fact that, um, that they've discovered 60% of basin development plans worldwide actually are put into use. And we think that that's also, that, that's without consideration to our new narrative. So even without the new narrative, 60% of these 11 dams, or um, in the entire basin, you know, there are scores of tributary dams uh, being built, will come to fruition. Within that context, for Laos, who is banking on income to service its, service its debt and to pay for other national programs, um, how does that compute? So therefore, you know, coming back to the Lao National Power Grid uh, as, as the solution to this, which would indeed include dams, very likely, on the Mekong. But again, which are the dams that should be built to be fed into the system? And then which renewables uh, can be plugged into that system to promote alternative development models for Laos? And, and those of you who are interested in, in development uh, and economic uh, development modeling, I think uh, Laos and Cambodia right now uh, would enjoy more uh, space for, for thinking about the future of Lao economic development without dams in, in that picture, without so many dams in that picture. Okay, thank you very much. I think our time is, uh, has come up. Uh, I, I think there is something new about this, uh, this report. Uh, it has more nuance. I think what we have understood to be the discourse uh, has seen more nuances in, in recent years, and that has been accounted for in the report. Uh, it's an issue that's old, but uh, is dynamic and is ongoing, so we have to, to keep monitoring it. It seems to me that the dams will be with us for an indefinite future. 
no way to get rid of them. Even though they, ideally we would do gas, um, it's good for everyone. But dams are here to stay. Uh, please join me in thanking all the speakers, uh, all the team Mekong from the Stimson Center, Dr. Richard Cronin, uh, Ms. Courtney Weatherby, and uh, Mr. Brian Isla, and our discussants, Dr. Carl Middleton and Ajahn Rumon Tapchumpon. Thank you very much. And thank you all for coming out. Next event is on. Thank you.